Um, I've, uh, my son has been telling me for years, um, but the nature of the way I work has generally been to not have music or not have distractions. But um, with certain things that are repetitive, I now put on music, but I also put on these podcasts. And, um, you know, they're just wonderful stuff. My, my um, wife. Intelligent, caring so, people. <laughs> so we got our... Our audience is streaming in okay. the uh, the Zoom room now, guys. Okay. The Zoom room. Welcome to the Zoom room. Welcome to Zoom room. We are getting ready to Zoom. <laughs> How many people we got in here, Ethan? Uh, so far, we got about 46 right now. Oof. Probably have a few more Ethan. joining us. Yeah. Wow. Look and at all. Look at all these humans. Yeah, do yeah, I get to see to... who's here? Let's see if I uh, gallery view. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that'll help. Garrett, look, gallery at all these, helps. look at all these humans, man. It's always fun. It's incredible. Ron Engels here. Jeez. Okay, I don't know if you guys can hear me, but I agree with Jurgen. Show me your faces just at least temporarily. It would be nice. In the kids. But dare to do that. That is. Uh... Hi, Linda. <laughs> Hi. Where's my thumb? So, so I'll get us rocking and rolling with the intro here, and then we'll dive right in. I'm sure some folks know who we're with here, but we'll uh, get the details in, out of the way. So first of all, welcome to Piano Tech Radio Hour. It's brought to you by Piano Technicians Masterclasses, an online educational resource that also offers you cutting edge instruction from piano industry masters without leaving your home. You can find out more at pianotechniciansmasterclass.com. And on today's episode, we have Chris Brown, RPT. He started work as a piano technician in 1977. A graduate of North Bennett Street School in Boston, he has worn many hats in his career, college technician, concert tuner, rebuilder, private customer, piano care provider, and teacher. In 2005, Chris officially specialized in grand regulation and rebuilding and as a designer, engineer, and manufacturer, started work on the tools and protocols that have become his grand work system, which speeds up and simplifies grand regulating. So Chris, we're really happy to have you here. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, particularly this year, where um, quite a number of the people that are joining us, I would have uh, been able to see person to person and uh, possibly give a hug of my uh, gladness to see them. Uh, here we are where we can't do that. But actually, the Zoom is pretty nice. Nice to see your faces or your names. And um, I'll tell you, yeah, I have great. very intimate meetings every single week on Zoom. And there's, there's ways to get beyond uh, boxy domains. There's ways to get deep and intimate and vulnerable and awesome. So. Well, we'd have a hard time, you know, it, it could happen in a classroom, but there would be people in the back row or standing in the doorway or something. Uh, and it, it wouldn't be as, uh, as personal in some respects as uh, this gathering. In, in a way, I totally agree with you. That's why Piano Technician's master classes were so amazing for me. You know, you, it was so vulnerable, so intimate. You know, you were right in the face of the instructor and very close to what he or she was doing. It was awesome. It, it is awesome. So, my burning question for you, Mr. Brown. We've known yeah. each other for a long time and really respected each other and been felt, I felt incredibly collegial with you and like you were one of the leaders in our our community. And my question is, how did you get from this high end, you know, uh, university and concert technician to making these insane machines to, you know, to trick out piano actions, grand piano actions? How, what, what, just give was, us, give us a Reader's Digest version of that, of that journey. Uh, both of our children were had left home 
Uh, one was still in college. And uh, no, actually, they were, they were both still in college, but an, an, a house came on the market that uh, my wife had been in flirtation with real estate agents uh, the 26 years, uh, 23 years that we'd been there. And um, it came on a postcard and I took a look at it and thought, wow, you know, this has a place for me to work. It's the right color. Uh, it's, this, it, it's like our house, except better. Uh, if I'm ever gonna move, here would be an opportunity. Well, as soon as we did move, we did, were able to purchase this house. My wife had buyer's remorse and was angry with me, but we did move. And when I moved, I got to change my shop and I set up specifically for action work. And uh, the stresses of that and um, anyway, I ended up with hurt elbows. And a year later, uh, I still had hurt elbows from uh, tuning. My, my friend Pat Drain had been through years and years of it. So Patrick Drain, yeah, yeah. Um, it suddenly occurred to me. You know, I have an opportunity to say no to my clients. I had uh, two great people that had come my way: uh, uh, Yoshi Kazuo Yoshizaki and uh, Jardin uh, Liu. And um, I offered them and wow. my clients wow. were happy. You know, some people turned away and I sort of wandered off into shop work, wow. which I sort of dreamed of, but not never quite believed in. And um, I went through a patch of not having an employee in my shop, which had been the case previously. And so I was left to my own devices and with my own thoughts. And it became clear there were things that really annoyed me about the way work went. And in particular, it was coming to the end of a regulation or a rebuild and um, trying to solve voicing issues, I would become aware of this hodgepodge of reasons why and the implication that really I could look at every note and find something in the hammer, in the travel, in the way the strings were. And um, it's, it's discouraging and unsettling when you realize that really what you're doing is mitigating. The, the best I could do in that final patch of work was to mute down and even up. And so I thought, you know, what if there was a way that I could make sure that uh, a hammer as it struck the strings was the way I wanted it to be rather than some other way? So let's just pause and I'm going to go back and ask you, what were those? This is, these are piano technicians, right? So we all are avid to know. What were the irregularities? What was that phenomenon that led you to say, well, all I can do is mitigate. I can't. Well, so a symptom of it would be uh, that I would have a hammer, uh, be mating it to the strings and lifting the strings to fit its surface, which I had carefully filed. Yeah. And I just wouldn't be able to get there. You know, I'd pull on the, on the muted one and keep pulling and I'd end up over lifting that string and creating another kind of a problem. Right. So it made me acutely aware of, um, of that vulnerability. And um, of course, there's an alternative that people employ, which is to file the hammer to fit yep. the strings. Yep. But that's not ideal because now you're changing the shape of the hammer and you're changing the shape of that hammer relative to the ones around it. That's right. And on a incredibly subtle, you know, if somebody's really paying attention in an extraordinary way to the sounds, the differences in sounds between note and note, then you can actually 
tell the difference in the hammer shape. And oh many, yeah, many and you put the soft pedal on, and if you misshape in the hammer to fit the strings in rest position, yes, it's quite possible they don't fit. Yes, and that that actually was the key to the idea that I had, which was that if the hammer could be vertical as it's striking the strings and the hammer be well filed, and then you fit the strings to the hammers, now you have the strings are level and parallel to the key bed and you put on the soft pedal and no matter how far in on the soft pedal you go, you have the same mating. Because the surface of the hammer is the same. And it's not right. Same. And, yeah. and the thing about if the strings aren't level in this mating, yeah. uh, a, a string that um, is low is hit first. You'll never solve that by playing. It will compress the area of playing more than the ones around it. So you'll always have a discrepancy. 75 years later, you'll still have a discrepancy. An attack discrepancy. Yeah. So the other thing about that is you're, you're saying that the hammer, I just need to understand. The hammer won't level the strings. Right. You can have a perfectly shaped hammer. hammer. Will pack at that lower exactly. level. Exactly. Where that one string is. And so the attack, the yeah. attack formation of that string is going to be different than the other two strings, which will create some kind of weird dissonance. Yeah. So the other thing about it. Uh, was that um, okay? Uh, okay, I'm gonna where I'm headed. I'll, I'll work back from it because I've forgotten the specific thing I was gonna say. Yeah. But um, one of the things I do at at the beginning of a regulation. Um, is to pre-lift all the wire. And that may sound a little radical because the way I'm gonna mate the strings to the hammers is by lifting the strings. And I don't want to um, spoil my chances for that having that kind of a fit because that's what the whole process is about. But if, if you have um, strings that have mated their hammer, say in the last 75 years, you've got a Steinway and somebody's been taking care of it and they're a good technician and they go through uh, a couple of times in its life and they fit, you know, they've done some regulation, they've filed the hammers and they're doing a fitting. And what happens is they, the hammer comes to the strings and they go pluck, pluck, pluck and it's mute, mute, mute. What are the chances that they're going to uh, question the stability of those three strings? take their string hook and try them out just to see if one of them is a little bit not stable. Any, any Would any of you do that? I wouldn't. <laughs> I, I would not. I would not. So, um, but there's a benefit to it. Um, so if you think of a, an underlifted string, when, when, you, um, when you string a piano, all the strings are underlifted and you have to settle it in and bring it up to pitch and um, you settle it on out on the belly, but you also um, settle it at the agrass and the b-bar. Right. And it's an ongoing process. And as, as your piano goes flat later on and it's pitch raised, uh, thankfully for us, uh, that process refreshes. Uh, and these var variables can be overcome at the A-graph or the V-bar to some degree. But if you have a fit, when you go to test it, you don't change those three strings. So you've got a sleeper there. And one of the things that can happen is that you take that as your string height measurement and it's um, a red herring. And so there's some, that's one of the variables that can cause you to not have um, a good fit when you get out to the bench. So to regulate. what does the whole generation of what I call glides up regulation in this insanely controlled environment of the, of the, of the tool, what does that lead to? Why is that 
such an incredible enhancement for this final crown jewel type stuff with string mating and, you know. Well, p part of the process is to make traveling vertical rather than parallel. Yep. You have a vertical array of parts that um, the, the shortest distance from rest to strike is a straight line that happens vertically. And the best bounce that you're gonna have from that system is if the hammer presents a horizontal surface to the horizontal strings and has a, wants to bounce straight back. So you've got better repetition, you've got better transfer of power and um, arguably better tone. And going back to this, um, the, the strings that are underlifted uh, an underlifted string is like a spring, and uh, and it can sit there almost uh, stabilizing with play, but not quite. And a very small amount of lift with a string hook, it can just move. You know, I would discover this as I'm doing my mating that some strings would just go whoop, or some, uh, you know, I'd be working on one. And then uh, another one would, I would have to adjust it and it would just go too far. Well, why was that? Uh, it was sitting there in an unstable place. And if you think of this swoop as a spring, that makes it difficult to tune. It probably affects the way the string vibrates. And um, there's the other end of it, which is if you lift that string too far, now you've got a bend in the other direction that wants, that is unstable. Hmm. And okay. if you can get your fitting to be in between uh, uh, in that stable area, then the whole thing will last and uh, uh, sound better, sound, have, have greater clarity. And uh, it, it describe, describe the sound better. Well, it has, it has greater clarity. It has uh, there are fundamental. Would you say would would that be a phrase you'd use? Uh, yeah, probably it has uh, a, a better agreement in the fundamentals and also in what happens above them. Probably particularly above them. Yeah. Question so, from the chat: so, Does that lessen false beats or create more? When well, if you overlift, level? overlifting can certainly create false beats. Now, underlifting, I don't know. I don't, I haven't been able to test with science any of this. This is, you know, how I picture it in my head. But I think that um, the tuning I end up with at the end of this process is more stable and the sound is more clear and it has more projection. Bottom end. So I think there's, there's something in it. And um, There's no here's, an, here's another aspect of it, which is uh, complexity and simplicity. When we're starting out, uh, we have a simple understanding of things. And, and as our understanding grows, we uh, are forced to acknowledge and witness the huge complexity of all the factors that go into um, from where the finger depresses the key to where the sound uh, comes out from the piano. It's and, why you stay humble if you're good. Yeah, and so this, the, the home stretch into voicing is where uh, the actions interface. Yes. Um, it's, it's very complicated, but anything that you can be sure of helps you simplified thing. So if I know that my hammers at strike are vertical and my and I know that my travel is vertical and it's simplified the range of things to attend to. And then when my hammers are well are, are well mated, if you go and then tune the piano after you've just done a perfect mating, do you still have a perfect mating? Likely not. So there's this place that you're headed to that has to be at pitch and in tune and well-mated all at the same time. So talk about 
like in a really laser fashion on how the regulation station gets those hammers completely in a micro measurable way vertical okay um uh, the squaring platform is was the th was actually that was the the idea that i came up with when i had this first thought that i thought would uh transform everything well of course it's one of 47 things that i had to do to get it to all integrate together uh, or more but uh, the idea was to get a surface over the back checks and under the tails so that with the hammers supported at strike. So the other part of the problem, obviously, is to know where strike is. Strike is a three-dimensional thing. It's not just string height. It's an in and out dimension. And it's a side to side dimension as well as an up and down dimension. You got, it's, a, it's a point for each string in space. Right. Like and, and obviously when you're in the piano with the hammer, yeah. uh, that, is, that is where it's happening. Yeah. And, uh, and that point turns out not to be a point, but it's a, it's a, a sliding area. Your, your hammer doesn't just go vertically, it goes around a circle back toward the player and it's rubbing into the string and bouncing and rubbing out from the string. Because of the action of the mechanics, yes. Yeah. So uh, the squaring platform out on the bench, once you have your keyframe bedding, so that was the big, biggest thing in a way for me to solve was how to bed okay. the keyframe so it was actually bedded well. That's because good. if your bedding isn't good, yeah. then no amount, no amount of what you do out on the bench is going to solve that. But you have to be absolutely confident. Yeah. It's not that hard to be confident, though. No, no, no. But You have to be willing to, to have a, a no answer in order to find that it's yes. Or so you have to be confident that the dimensions that you've created on the bench with these tools and protocols is exactly what that what are the dimensions and the the readings of the cavity of the piano, the actual right. key that of the piano. So how do you, this is a question that I've always, that, that I've had, but I have never asked you. So I'm asking it to you now. Sure. What, what gives you your degree of certainty that you can absolutely recreate those internal conditions externally. Well, that's course, the big, that's the big, I don't know, you know. No, you know, no, no, no. It, uh, it, proof is in the pudding. So when you do your work and you go back to the piano and it's in the right place, then, yeah. then you know that you did it. But you need to know ahead of time what to do. And uh, I discovered a whole series of things that were not accurate enough in the way that we did it. Huh. Uh, traditionally. Uh, so hold for instance, hold the idea thought. of key dip. Yeah. Okay. Hold that thought. So I really want this to be a forum today. This guy's got massive, you know, resources. And I want, and I'm challenging everybody in this room with me to ask a question, to, to, to get into this, to pay attention to this and say, wow, what can I learn from this if I ask a question that I have? And I want you to come up with that. And I want you to either raise your hand uh, digitally or write the question in the chat. All you gotta do is bang the chat button and write. Um, we got a couple of questions. So awesome. Pat, so Pat asked one before. Anytime, Ethan, anytime. This is cutting back a little bit, but just, just a quick question. Do you seat strings on the bridge before or after or both? I'm not before, sure whether that's before or after what? What? Yeah, maybe it's part of the, it's part of or... preparation. Uh, so I would do or it after, before, before my before mating, after. if that's what mating, you mean. mating that mating the hammers to the strings. I'm I'm sure you're talking. And about. Um, each and each place that there the, is a bearing the point. String, 
is the string lifting that you're talking about, is that something that you consider part of seating the strings on the bridge? No, not really, because that's at a different part of the piano. Well, it's, so it's, it's at, the, at the plate, and it's yeah. something that I do as a preliminary. And I so do you it would do... only very moderately. I'm, okay. I'm not yanking on anything, because anything that's unstable will respond right. and just go there. And I don't want it to go too far. So I'm just going through every string with a, with a little nudge. So if you, when you're doing the string lifting, so would you go to the bridge first and do uh, string seating then, and then do the string lifting? No, at no, the plate, um, this is for the other way. Th this is a question of stability, right. the string okay. lifting. So it's like a different thing. You could just think of it. Well, it's a preliminary to it because if I don't okay. do that string lifting, then I can have embedded these strings that are less stable that can show up in the tuning, and, and but you, not enough to troubleshoot and to know are there. All right, so do you just go from whatever number, whatever in the bottom to whatever in the top? One, one to 88. All right, and just a little, and what kind of a string hook do you use? Uh, it's a traditional one, I guess. Yeah, it's with, a T, so it's a T ha handle. Um, oh, really? With the little hook on the on the, the little hook on the end, or um, I have used in the past a bass string that I convert into a string hook. Cool, but that's just an essential tool in your in your in your work beyond chef. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll cut into the next question here. Uh, let's see. This one is from Paul T. Williams. Uh, oh, Pat was, he was following up with Pat's question, which is about this, the seating of the strings. He said, I think they go together, but near the strike point is more important for the hammer meeting. And then oh. Ed Whitting said, string lifting, use a level? Do we use a level for string lifting? Or okay, uh, this is part of my process. I have a tool for leveling strings from underneath. It's my standalone string height tool. Call it an under level. That was Dale Probst name that he gave me. Um, and a, a virtue of that is that you can use it at strike, which is the uh, important place for the strings to be level. Uh, and I sell this tool and it's useful to some people, but if I have my druthers, I make the hammers and travel vertical and then I fit the strings to the hammers. So I achieve the same thing from the other end and I do uh, both uh, processes in um, in one in one adjustment. Awesome. So you're holding that thought, and we're going to come back to the how you make it vertical after we do these questions. So that's that's a fascinating yeah. question. So go ahead, Ethan, with questions. Yeah, we definitely pick up the action here in the conversation. Let's see. We got uh, David said. I think that's Dave Skolnick. Uh, are we prepared to have an extended conversation about bridge string seating? It might take a <laughs> subject, but it's complicated. <laughs> right, and you you want to be moderate there as well because um, you can't get a string to take an acute angle of any sort, and you don't want to. It would be in a fixed position, so. Uh, you don't want a string riding up its bridge pin, but it could be riding up with the bridge pin. So you don't want the bridge pin in the air and the string in the air and, and so on. Um, in the speaking length, in an early day of my career at an institution that I will not name because it's embarrassing to me, uh, I strung their, one of their working pianos and I went to town on settling everything because if, if settling a little was good, settling more was better. And I ended up with all kinds of false beats that I created with these new strings that I put on the piano. So you want to be very careful and you don't want to, uh, you don't, don't want to create problems for yourself. It's the great mantra of the high-end piano technician, which is sneak up on it. <laughs> be conservative man if you've ever lost a whole account and client and everything because 
you went too far in voicing, got too aggressive or in something else. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's part of the art because in a way, uh, you know, take tuning as the example. The only way that you know that you're in the best spot is when you go past it. Right. You can see or you can hear where the best spot is and then you can go back to it. Then you have to believe that the thing that you've done is taking you to that best spot right. and you can test for it. But um, yeah, you, you lose your perception of the thing. So there was a question earlier on which was, that you asked, which was, how do I know about the keyframe bidding? And there is one tool that I created along the way that actually gets to sort of the nub of the whole thing in terms of the keyframe. And I call it a key step. And it was actually a version of the key jack or, you know, we'd have a piece of hardwood, hard, hardwood that we'd bore for a machine screw and turn up the machine screw to support our end keys for leveling. Right. And everybody, everybody has done that and, and that's been passed down to us and it's a very useful tip. Well, I decided to make these out of plastic and in particular put a hole in it so they would go on the key pins. Um, and, uh, and anyway, the first time I went to use it, uh, I turned up well, I, had, I, I, I was adjusting it to level the keys. And I had a notion that should really have struck me 30 years before or more. And uh, should have could have would have. Somebody's requesting to control my camera. I guess I declined. Don't worry about it. I'm not sure who that is. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think where was it's I? China, but don't worry about it. Yeah, it's either China uh, or Russia. You, now these these. Oh, I know. Okay, I just I just want to an finish answering your question. Yeah. So so uh, I I would turn up the jack to support my level, and it occurred to me that I ought to pre-level the keys. And um, I attended the first of the thirty-seven steps, and I learned this from my teachers, uh, that cutting punchings and inserting them isn't as much of a hassle as I thought it was, particularly at the ends. So I only do it at key number one and key 88, but I will shim those keys up to be the height that I want. And if I'm not changing the key level, I still shim them up because um, I want my straight edge to rest on those two and go all the way across the keys without touching any other keys. And then I actually use the key step in the middle on E44 to jack up its key to just touch the straight edge. That gives me the overall shape of the, of the keyboard. So you use punchings to jack up the end keys. Right. So, so when I'm done, I'm done. Although, yeah. you know, the first time I switch punchings and I do take the top stack off to do that, I put hole punchings in instead of the uh, cut ones. Yeah. Or I take out the cut ones uh, if I'm not going to be level once I'm set up on the bench. So anyway, what, what happened was um, I pre-leveled these end keys and um, I turned up my machine screw in my new little tool. So it would just touch. And, and this is what made me think of it is that I use a tap test. And as soon as it stops tapping, you you don't know where you are. So you have to have faith that you've turned it up the least amount into the tap so what you want is for that machine screw to just touch the underside of the key so that it doesn't move, it doesn't move it up in the process of touching it. But when that happens, your key has been sitting there on the back rail and the bounce rail. And now it's touching your front rail through the key step. It's touching all three rails and that key becomes a gauge for where the key for, for where its key frame is underneath it. In other words, where it is in three dimensions, you just transfer that somehow. So go ahead. It's, it's memorized by this little key step. So when we're out on the bench, if we recreate the same it's symptom, we have to do it. it it's memorized, you say. Well, it's memorized in, its own, in the distance. It is the distance between the hardwood of the front rail 
and the underside of the key. That is exactly where the key is just sitting there on the back rail and the bounce rail. Right. So, so you're saying that that key position isn't going to move, that the, that the rails may move, but the key position won't move. Is that right. So out on the bench, we have the complexity of figuring out how to shim what in order to recreate this. But as soon as we've recreated that exact space, now our regulation is going to work. Okay. Because we're going to have the right dip. We have the right key height. We have the right rise, hammer rise from that key dip. And we can set up our strike. And I set up the strike through the hammer with a, a weighted um, kissing sample, which I can tell you about. But anyway, that gives me confidence. And um, it, the process made me realize that, you know, the idea of, of doing it with key dip is not a bad idea, except that we've got um, a, uh, a flexible punching that compresses. And we have our, our smallest refinement of front punchings is three thousandths thick. Well, three thousandths uh, discrepancy in your keyframe is, uh, is a crucial discrepancy. Yeah. It's gonna give you a knock. It's gonna cause trouble as it's uh, amplified through the system. So um, anyway, um, getting, uh, getting three-dimensional strike in, the, yeah. in exactly the right place. And when your hammers are at strike um, relative to their keyframe in the piano, if I bring uh, it all out and make the keyframe the same as it was in the piano. Now my dip is going to work the same, and my sample of strike, which I do with the hammer, is is more accurate than uh, a gauge can produce. And so, it how do you any numbers? How do you recreate exactly the keyframe environment? Uh, well, on the bench, you fix the position of the keyframe. And uh, if I'm just on a bench, not the fancy bench, uh, shim the back rail so it's stable, shim the front rail so it's stable and has the symptom of uh, you gently hold down the, key, the front rail guide pins yep. and you shim that front rail so that when you put the uh, straight edge on top of the end keys, that that metal, middle key is just touching, sitting on top of its key step that we jacked it up with. So there's if no it's little... too high, it will be unstable at one or both ends. And if right. it's too low, it will tap in the middle. Tap in the middle. It's okay. really, really accurate. Okay. You want stability in all three places. Okay. Should I shoot back uh, some questions from the chat? Absolutely. Let's do it. All right, next one, I'm just gonna go back a little bit so we might retrace some steps, but next one was Nancy. She said, seems like an unending spiral, tune, move strings, tune, made. Each process will- <laughs> Can't get there from here. <laughs> you gotta walk away at some point. Yeah, see, I mean, you can make an argument that you cannot tune a piano, and yet we do tune a piano. It's like Zeno's and, Paradise. Um, that's a whole other thing. I have, a, I have a method for tuning pianos that are similar, similar to this, which, um, what we're, we human beings and piano technicians in general, in particular, are really good at guesstimating. Trial and error is one of our great strengths. And, you know, we learn it from the earliest age. When we get up on our two legs and walk around, we're doing that all the time. And when we learn to, to tune a piano, we're doing it uh, three-dimensionally with this the tension thing and twist and... Um, we internalize something and we use trial and error to get there. That's right. And um, no, we, that's right. That's how we learn everything. So numbers may be a help in researching what it ought to look like. It, you know, there are functions for numbers and um, I don't want to diminish their importance, but how many decimal places are you taking that number out to? How about when you have to convert it to metric or vice versa? You know, numbers are problematic and you have to 
first of all, decide on what the number is, and then you have to decide on how to interpret it when you get out to the other end. What if you take the number and somebody else interprets it? Well, and it's, it's really like we were talking about before we got on the air, uh, Chris. It's like, you're, in one sense, numbers are a limiting story that can limit your ability to actually hear and feel the instrument. Mm. And I think that's, don't get me started, because I can speak <laughs> the hour to that stuff. That, that, that's, a, that's a long and interesting discussion. I mean, it also reveals another aspect of who we are as piano technicians, which well, yeah. comes with the territory. We are philosophers, because you're faced with something that is apparently impossible that you have to do in a time frame that is often, sometimes quite impossible. You know, you're given 15 minutes to do the best that you can for a concert. That's ridiculous on the surface of it. And yet you do, uh, you imbue com confidence to the player. They, they do a, a great job at their concert. Nobody notices, but but the other side of that is totally irrational. So, as regulators, uh, mostly we face touching things up as an extra that we either offer or we just include, uh, and it helps. But what what happens when you have the customer to whom expense is no restraint? And they've heard that you're the person to do the job and they want the job done right. Well, what is the job done right? And that is something I've had a, a long, hard look at because I found myself in that position and getting to this end game where I know there are all kinds of things not quite right about what I've done. It looks perfect, but from the sounds it's making, I know it isn't perfect. Mm -hmm. and, it, and, there, and, and that imperfection, there's a layer of it that there, I can't do anything about. So how am I a, a clear-headed, clear-hearted witness to what the thing actually is so that I can do as much as can be done with the limitation of resources that I have? But if I have no limitation of resources, there's no excuses to fall back on, how do I get it the rightest that it can be in this whole game of compromise? Yeah. And there is no perfection. There, no. The perfection is a balance of compromise. And, and there, may be a, there may be a series of, you could have three different people that arrive at three slightly different solutions that all- Well, that's it, that's it. And when that piano is recorded or listened to, it sounds awesome. The thing is, when you realize that it's just, different degrees of excellence. It cannot be like, ah, this is the final end. <laughs> you know. Eureka, we've discovered it. And it's going to be changing in the moment that you discover it anyway. So. Exactly. It's, it's much more like a sand painting than a regular painting. It's, it's constantly shifting. So, Ethan, more questions, my brother. Let's hit it. All right. So we this one might be take a little bit longer, I don't know, but, and we've been addressing it a little bit. Uh, isn't it hard to duplicate certain things from the bench in the piano? There are no strings on the bench. Uh, let's cover there are no strings on the bench just for one, and then we'll move on to the next question. If, if you want. Okay, so that. there are no strings on the bench, um, but I've come up with a version of the traditional let off rack that has, it has 30 templates of various lengths and you apply one template for each section with the exception of uh, a, a long tenor in which often there is a little bit of a triangle there. So I use two templates, but jointed. And the lower edge of that template becomes an approximation of strike. But it's a very close approximation. So uh, how do I get how do I have confidence that it is the mean or the average of that particular section? Uh, I take my samples as far out in each section as I can. That maximizes their accuracy. 
Um, but I can't go right to the end sometimes because I've got my, what I call bedding samples, which are with the key steps that are for each uh, of the glide bolts, which they support the balance rail. And they're both the most sensitive and the place of greatest stability for um, the balance rail. Uh, and that's where we ad adjust our keyframe bedding from. Uh, so in front of each of these glide bolts, I have a key step. And uh, for the two end ones, I pre-level them and then adjust the key step to just touch. But it, each other place, those key steps just go up and just touch their key. So I have these slices that are gonna be accurate if I can achieve them out on the bench. And then I have the overall shape with the, the E44 that I've jacked up and the straight edge on the two end keys. Um, the other samples that I take, and I take, have to take the punchings out of the bedding samples, obviously, because the key step goes in there. But um, I also take the punchings out of what I call strike samples um, because I need extra key dip to have enough follow through for and I use a WNG weight on the end of the key because it's self-positioning and it's, and it's fairly heavy. And what I do is I back up the let off button until the hammer blocks against the string with this weight. And then I carefully turn it down until it just drops. And then I'll go and refine each strike sample so that it sort of just hesitates and drops. Then when I go out to the bench, once I've done my uh, keyframe setup. Um, I put the same weight on the ends of the keys. This time I'm at the end with the rack with, with the uh, templates. And I'll loosen, uh, there are two nuts for each template that hold it in place. And I'll loosen one and I'll pinch uh, and I'll make the template so that it's blocking with the hammer with the weight on the end of the key. And I'll pinch it up until it just lets go. And I'll rough them all in and then I'll come back and I'll get them so they all just hesitate and thump. Uh, this is just far more accurate than um, I have a, I have a gauge, uh, which, you know, was a big improvement on previous ways um, I'd done it. But I would find there'd be little discrepancies. And this, this does have one place where there's a discrepancy, which uh, is on string number three, which is the most flexible string. Uh, in the scale. And I provide a little 200 gram weight that you just put on the string. It touches a neighbor's string as well to balance there as close as you can get to strike because often, um, generally speaking, there are dampers in the way. But a, a benefit of this system also is that you check the back rail, you check the front rail with the, with the balance rail uh, pulled out of the way, um, and you and you check your cheek box first. Actually, that's the first thing that you do. And generally, um, you can you can confirm the back rail and the front rail. If you've actually got a real problem, then you have to take things apart, and there's protocols to do that. But if the way it's all put together, those check out, then all you have to do is the balance rail, and you haven't had to take anything apart. And now you can go out to the bench still without taking anything apart and set up. And that is really fast when it happens that way. If your keys need easing, well, you've got to ease them first before you take your samples. If you have things rubbing, if you've got junk on the key frame, if you've got glue drips or stuff like that, you know, you have to take care of it. But if you've got a piano that's, say, uh, at a university that is basically in good shape or brand new, you want to sweep out the key bed, put the thing in, and you can take your samples and you're set up in no time. Yeah. So cool. when you first, two questions. First of all, when you first did this and made these incredibly precise, you know, adjustments on a piano action, what was the, you know, the artist, the client, the player's reaction? Well, it, it becomes invisible to them. They were happy with my work anyway, or they were, were prepared to be. 
Um, but I was happier at the end. And I think they're a degree happier, but they don't get to compare the what it would have been and the what right. it turns out to be. So it's, it's ephemeral in a way. But how do you, okay, so there is a point when you're doing this work on a bench, you've got various advantages of light and height and environment, and you don't have the customer hovering and so forth. But you have this potential disadvantage. If anything challenges your confidence in your setup, you've got the piano in another place and your action here. Yep. So I've been, I've taken visits back to the piano and that's not the way the system is supposed to work, but I did it um, on occasion to find out that there was something odd in the piano that I hadn't noticed. And when I'm setting up on the bench, I think, you know, this can't be, I must have made a mistake. And so I went back to the piano to confirm that the problem was in the piano, uh, like a, a, a back rail of the key bed that suddenly goes off on a slope. You know? uh, there, there are things on the key bed that, you know, if, if you've got, the, um, the rail and style set up so that they're not flush as your back rail goes over them and they're not flush as your front rail goes over it, you can't solve that with keyframe bedding. If you've got uh, an action that has had the, the glide bolts turned down and is elevated, is bearing against the dogs at the back in an upward way, you're never going to create that on the bench. You'll chase your tail and not be able to solve it. Got so it. you need to have real confidence that what you've got out there on the bench is what you had in the piano. That's and if it. you do have that confidence, then you're flying. That's right. That seems to me to be the key to this system. Ethan, let's quickly do, we got time for two more, I think, through two more. I, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to rip through the comments that are there. We'll read them all and then we could pick out whatever cool. sounds good. Cool. And maybe there's some redundance, we'll see. Okay, so we've got, if I can catch up where I was. <laughs> oh my goodness, there's so many comments here. <laughs> David, you really stimulated everyone to, to, to chat. Okay. Can these be forwarded uh, on to me um, when we're yeah, done? Yeah, Absolutely. yeah, we could do that for sure. Okay, we got this. Seems like an under spray. I love the okay. I love the under level tool, even when it's not what it, you use now. Uh, also have Ed Whitting strings do ride up bridge pins because whether playing and whether playing in the and the coil and the wire or something else, seating strings on the bridge is necessary on an ongoing basis. It must be done lightly in all cases. Uh, Johan Krebs says, agraph height in the grand piano base and mid-range sections can vary depending on the thickness of the agraph, washers installed, or from a warp, usually upwards in the plate. Not many plates are level. Can that be accommodated by the workstation or are final adjustments made in the piano? Um, got... Tick that one. I, I'd like to speak to that one when we're through the okay. rest. Yeah. That one. Yeah. Keep going. Okay. David said, must be sure that the frame is clamped at the ends. I've got Paul Williams saying, brilliant perfection is a balance of compromise. Ed Whitting, the 15 minute concert tuning. Are you a piano tuner technician under contract to perform concert work or are you a piano tuner that was called at the last minute to tune that piano? Don yeah, Rose, right. I hate- That's, that's a big I, difference. <laughs> I hate that the hall knows for literally months that the piano will be in use and calls me at the last possible moment. <laughs> I had a drop dead contract with the local hall for a lot of years. Paul T. Williams, Don, been there, it sucks. Even with people I work with here at the university, they'll say, oh yeah, we want both pianos tuned together in the recital hall with one lid removed. Can't, can't tell you how many times. <laughs> um, Mike Barley, for me, using Chris's system ends up giving better results for two big reasons. One, the increased precision that the tools and protocols themselves provide. And two, increased accumulated confidence on his part Ask oh. about this if there is time. Yeah. Yep. That, that was the next field I wanted to, if we had time at the very end, to talk about what it does for you mm. in terms of talk about confidence. That's what confidence is for, to give you more power. You have more power 
humble power, the better identifiers you are, the better communicator you are, the more you can just stand behind all this stuff. Well, that that was the initial uh, problem presented to myself. How could I be sure? So now when I go to the piano, after it's been prepped and regulated, and uh, there are things that I am sure about, and so, as, as sure as I can be. Right. So your experience over the past years has been you take that action off that awesome hothouse environment of your bench and your station and back to the piano and it works like a charm. Yeah, it, it fits. So I, I just want to say, though, you don't need my fanciest system. You can have your own bench, some key steps and a couple of WNG tools yep. and, and set up. If, if you look at my starter system, it gives you uh, the tools to do it. But if, if you look at my starter system and you think about what you have, there may be redundancies where mm -hmm. you, can, you can make the little steps. Uh, you know, you can, um, by the way, my four protocols, which go into my setup and order of operations for each of these systems, um, there are two pages each. You can laminate them for checklists or you can, uh, you know, they're outlines. Um, one is a betting protocol. One is a sampling protocol. One is the overall regulation protocol. And the other, I call the alignment protocol, which is basically, uh, a review of the principles of why I do what I do and why the system is set up the way it is. And are these materials public domain? Or they, are... they are on my website and they are for free. Wow. You, you have to purchase them, but you purchase them for zero. <laughs> okay, that's awesome. Ethan, how are we doing on time? And, and uh, what do we have left? And uh, uh, we're pretty close to wrapping this up, aren't we? Yeah, we got about three or four minutes. I just put the link in the chat where you can get these papers, these white papers that awesome. uh, Chris said just mentioned. Yeah, and I, I just downloaded them the other day. You just, you know, you just gotta pretend that you're buying something basically and put in your email address so he can send you the documents. And uh, yeah, we've got. Uh, also, just want to remind everybody that I put some. We put some links in the chat. Uh, to register for next week's radio hour. Uh, we got a feedback link for this week's radio hour. We really love to hear from you and hear how things are going for you, what you like, what you don't like, how we can improve and what's working and also direct access. So if you want to support this project for just eight bucks a month, then we'll always make sure you get the direct link, you know, way uh, ahead of schedule and make sure you get it before you, you can jump on here. And uh, again, you can register for next week's radio hour, which will be Boaz Kirschenbaum, who was supposed to be on here a couple of weeks ago, but he was sick and he has uh, agreed to come next week. So that'll be fun. Yeah. And an upcoming master class, hopefully with Del Fondrick um, at the towards the middle to end of September. Yeah. And that's actually a master class that we're doing. We're still deciding whether I'm going to go out there and, and film it live or we'll do some uh, uh, alternative yeah. format. But yeah, he'll be giving a lecture in, uh, in a few weeks. And we'll probably do the radio hour with him as well. And then just yeah. have a lecture after that. I'd love to do that. Do them in conjunction. Yeah. So again, cool. Chris Brown. Wow. Massive resources. You know, we could have spent three hours, you know, getting into the details of this. And the fact then that you have public domain information to help people gain the confidence which is the most important thing and really see what you're saying yeah, that's key really. it is and so our deepest gratitude to you uh brother i, I just want to say that um you know it's so nice to be able to uh be in this position where everybody's listening to me say how great it is to see you guys yeah. <laughs> give you all a hug yeah awesome. and you are beautiful community, Pianotech Radio Hour community from for showing up and paying attention. We can, you know, you can feel the attention in the room, and it's great. It's a lot of wisdom, 
a lot of simpatico, uh, you know, atmosphere, and I'm just so grateful. Yeah, so, it's really great. We had a, we had a great attendance though as well. We started out with about 45 people. We shot up past 80, and we had about 15 over on YouTube, Facebook, and so forth. So wow. we had a good audience today. People uh-huh. jumped on. So we appreciate you all being here. And also, yeah, again, thanks to Chris. And I've been noticing we haven't really got to chat, you know, call you out and maybe we'll be able to do this more in future episodes. But Chris has been here quite regularly. So we appreciate you, you know, uh, having an appreciation for what we're doing and showing up and being a part of the community as well. Uh, It's it's excellent. Yeah. Yeah, Love. Thanks so much. All right, brother. Awesome. Okay. Well, I'll sign us off and we'll be in touch later. So we'll see you on the flip side, folks. Bye, guys. Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming. Stay safe. Appreciate it. Well, happy.